thank you. Is the mic on? It should be. Okay. Uh, thank you for a very good introduction. I learned a lot of new things that I've not realized, and it's great to look, look back as well. And it's, I'm particularly honored to be on, on this stage because roughly five years ago was the previous time that I was on this stage. There, actually, there was a container roughly here, and we were three, three people sitting at the research lab or research wing, uh, me, Andy, and Krista. <clears throat> and we were truly inspired by the entrepreneurial uh, mindset uh, that, that Design Factory had at that time already, and that was one of the very rare places at Aalto University where we were able to actually find that spirit. And uh, the, the first thing that I learned when I came here was that the household guy called Eto told me that, Krista, don't ask for, for permission, that ask for forgiveness. Go and do it and ask for forgiveness if it, if it doesn't go that well. And a few months later, Kalevi and Lauri, Eetu and Lauri Repokari told that there is an open actually space there. There is only uh, Kasi Desi there, that it's kind of a, not maybe the best way of using that. Why don't you go there and, and ask for forgiveness afterwards? And we did, and that's why, why Startup Sauna got started. Uh, and now it's the second time I'm here on the stage, probably on my life. So that's very, very great. And I think the thank for the things that Aalto ES and a lot of people have been able to achieve is, is a lot of to the culture that Design Factory was able to, to put into us at the early days. Uh, how many of you are students at the moment? Half. How many of you do have a startup already, own, own company? One fifth. How many of you are thinking about starting a company in the coming six months? I hope they're not the same people that are having a company. I don't know. Might be. And how many of you are thinking about joining a, a startup, fast-growing startup in the coming, coming months? Not maybe at the founder, but as an employee. And some of have joined. Okay. No, that's, that's really good. I want to keep this session very, very interactive. Your time is extremely precious and my time is extremely precious as well. And the only way that we will be benefiting out of this session is that you ask questions and you help me to tell the things that you want to learn. And if you don't, then I'll talk something for 45 minutes and no one remembers what we've been discussing and no one is happy. So please be very interactive. Yes. You can, you can shoot questions anytime you want, and more the better. And there is no such thing as a stupid, stupid question. Or there is only stupid answers. Uh, and uh, what I was thinking to put, put things a bit in the perspective, and I had a few, few comments on the Facebook post that Olli, Olli posted, that I try to tie in my story that what it takes to, to get started uh, with, with the startup. Because many of you are probably thinking about starting a startup, as nowadays many of the, the people are. So what it takes to get, get started, because it's extremely difficult, and also tie that story in, that how Alto ES, Startup Sauna, Startup Life, Alto Ventures Program, Stanford, everything else, uh, have helped me to, to get, get started. So that's what I was thinking about focusing. That's a totally different thing what I do now when I'm, I'm scaling a startup. It's totally different things, it's totally different requirements, and I can ta happily talk about that as well. We are now 65 people, we are growing extremely rapidly. We 7x'd seven, seven our revenue in the past 11 months, and we are kind of growing more faster than 75% of the public listed companies in US did grow at this stage. So we are like super scaling, and that's tough, and it's totally different from my perspective what it was a year ago or, or two years ago. And I can answer those questions as well. Does it sound like a good plan or a very bad plan? Good one. Good one. Okay. Very few comments. Uh, so, first of all, briefly, briefly, what we do at the moment and what is the background so that you can put things that I tell in the perspective. And it's only one man's opinion. So, a lot of other startups have succeeded because of the other things. So, I, I, I used first 
three years of my professional career as an economist. I, I studied economics and I worked at the uh, School of Economics as a research assistant and then also at Bank of Finland as a research assistant, uh, thinking that how the macroeconomic of Russia uh, impacts to fin Finnish uh, GDP growth. I got very fed up. That was absolutely not my competitive advantage and uh, not the environment where I was able to, to perform at all. So then, then I used the second uh, three years of my professional careers, first starting Alto ES, then starting Startup Sauna, and then uh, helping to get started with Alto Ventures program and uh, Startup Life, and among other things with, with Stanford and Alto, Alto Partnership. And then the last three years of my professional career, been mostly banging our, my head against the wall and failing with, with several startups. And now with the latest, uh, smartly, we've been actually getting from uh, the, the states, from the zero states where you have no product, no customers, and you are bankrupt all the time, the states that we actually have customers, we have cash flow, cash flow and, and we actually help our customers to grow their business, which is fairly essential for a startup. Uh, so what we do and what all these advice that I try to give, which you should not believe, but, but think, take with the, with the gray of salt, is related to B2B startups. So I do SaaS software, software as a service. I, I don't understand games. I don't understand customer services, mobile apps or anything like that. I understand software as a service, fast growing software as a service. Our customers are e-com, largest e-com advertisers and online travel agencies globally in all the continents, in, in APAC, LADAM, US, EMEA, Middle East, uh, globally. Uh, and we help them to get better sales from Facebook and Instagram at the moment. So that's what we do and that's what I kind of understand and I understand very few other things. Uh, any questions so far? A lot of things, yes, a lot of things, very good question. A lot of things uh, that you should not do, and not many things that you should do, but, but uh, my first startup was, was uh, FunRank. Uh, it was a mobile app for, for like Foursquare for events. I, I learned that you should not build that kind of startups in, in Helsinki, first of all, and then that your team dynamics needs to be such that actually someone at the team can code and you cannot outsource the coding and also that I can't understand consumer software. So that's kind of what I learned there. Uh, that was only three months. Uh, we couldn't take it anywhere. And the second startup was uh, Metrify. We did that for one and a half years. Uh, it was predictive analytics for, for mobile, mobile gaming companies. So we were thinking about predicting the lifetime value of, of uh, each user in order to maximize uh, the, the revenue and the conversion for a paying customer. And a uh, few things that we learned and uh, we did not do wrong at, at, at Smartly uh, was that, again, that the team <coughs> needs to have, the, the founding team needs to have, have very unified vision how to build a company. Also what to build, but how to build. And uh, what's the motivation of, of building a company? Because if the founders are not aligned in a very deep level, when things go, go south, things go wrong, you, you, you quit. You won't be able to do it. Uh, the other thing that we learned was that you should never ever focus on raising funding, but serving the customers. So we focused three first month of the, of the company to, to build great PowerPoints, slideware, not software, to, serve, to, to, to get funding. And then we failed. Uh, so it meant that we were one year without, without any salary, so everyone was practically personally bankrupt at that time when we, when we quit. Uh, th then we learned that, that in order to understand the customer needs, uh, you need to build end-to-end -end solutions, working prototypes, not, not uh, asking your customers what they would like to have because you understand it wrongly. But only when they see and they can try out uh, the things and what we did is that we, we had wireframes, then, then at, at Metrify wireframes of the product, but nothing like nothing on the back end, none of the functionality at the back end, but not slides, not, not even in our case, paper prototypes would not have been enough, but very fast uh, wireframes of, of, of the working, 
working product. So actually when they press the button in the front end, something happened. In the UI, something happened. But in the back end, nothing happened. Uh, so at, at Metrify, so the previous company which failed, we, we did a lot of slide work again. And, and we thought that we know what customer wants. We, we discussed with EA and we actually agreed a, a, a uh, pilot with EA, which is a public list, the world's largest gaming company in the US, just two guys from Helsinki traveling there. They were got really excited. Then we came back to Helsinki and realized that we have no clue what they actually wanted. Then we hired a team and built the technology, the predictive, uh, predictive lifetime value, uh, analytics, big data, Hadoop, blah, 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 and all the other buzzwords for half a year. And we went back to to, to Silicon Valley to show that to, to Disney and EA and they told the boys that this was very far what we, we meant. Uh, we, we actually have no use for this, what you just built. So we wasted again six months. Uh, yeah, and then we, we failed selling the company, we failed doing consulting, we failed to, to pivot the company and everything else. So I think we failed in every aspect of a startup that you can actually fail. But we did not do the same mistakes again, but we did a lot of others in the, in the, in, uh, smartly. That's, <laughs> we, we, we did, we have two founders, we had two founders to, to, uh, at, at this company. So, and that's probably kind of the, that, that's in my opinion, the hardest thing. And at least Steve Blank and Paul Graham, who are two big startup thinkers, blame that 95 of the percent of the startups fails because of uh, disagreement between the founders. Uh, and at least all my failures uh, in, in past life being because of, of the founder disagreement. So I can at least with my small uh, data set, I can approve that. So uh, I can tell what we did and what we did not. Uh, I don't know if it's any helpful, but so my, my co-founder and our CTO Tuomo, uh, this is also our third startup together. So he's been my co-founder, not actually at the first startup, he was not a co-founder, but he was the guy who we, we hired to build the software at, at FunRank. And then at Metrify, uh, we were struggling. We were the two founders, and then we hired kind of two other founders afterwards. And now at Smartly, we are the two founders. And Tuomo uh, lived when I was living in Silicon Valley and starting the Stanford collaboration and, and startup life. Tuomo actually lived <laughs> with his previous startup uh, in our apartment. With, with my wife and, and two kids for, for three months. So he kind of, we, we got pretty, we knew pretty well ourselves, uh, each other before starting Metrify. Uh, but the tough part is that it doesn't really help if you talk about the company vision and uh, where you want to take the company. Of course, those things need to be aligned, but the vision of the company uh, changes. It changes when you get more feedback from customers, it changes when the market changes and so forth. But something that doesn't change is what you believe in and what you want to achieve in your life. And if it's very different uh, between the co-founders, when things don't go really well, uh, you, you most likely quit. So if someone, this is, this is an example, if someone is motivated by money, don't build a startup that most likely will not happen. You, you get much richer in a much shorter time to go to McKinsey or investment bank in, in London. Uh, if, if your motivation is, is to boost your ego and be on the front page of, of Helsinki and Sanoma, don't build a startup because it has actually a negative effect to success of your startup. Uh, and that's, those two things are very common motivations for, for a lot of people. Also, what is very different nowadays and five years ago, the five years ago, no one wanted to build a startup. Now everyone wants to build a startup because it's the thing to do. Five years ago, it was maybe to go to work at Nokia. And uh, that also kind of creates the environment that everyone should be building startups and absolutely not everyone should be building startups. Uh, so you need to think that what are the 
what are the motivations behind and they are aligned. If you both are excited about getting rich fast and about being in the front cover of, of Helsingin Sanomat, your chances to succeed are much higher than the one is and one is not. Still, your chances to succeed are pretty small. But, but so for us, the things that really motivates us and what, what unites the whole team at Smartly, but also the founders is, uh, and that this is also what we believe that is, is kind of a purpose of our, our life. And that's, that's learning, that's developing yourself, that's developing yourself professionally, but also mentally, uh, developing yourself, give, give, keeping good, good care of your health and keeping good care of your family, but, but first of all, learning new things learning new things and that's ultimately I believe that that uh, gives you an opportunity to, to get freedom and to get freedom to do whatever is important to you. Maybe important thing is to cure the cancer or help Africa or whatever it is but but if, if you learn it, it means that you have the skill set, the leadership skills but also the technical skills uh, to do whatever is, is, is taken. If, if you maximize your learning, ultimately you get the capital that you need to get the freedom and also you get the contacts to, to get the, the freedom. And I mean, Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates are great uh, examples of very free man. Uh, so in the short term, maximizing your learning, meaning very, very painful things and awful life to you and your family. In the long term, I, I believe, I've not seen that yet, but I believe that it, it gives you uh, happiness and freedom. But what it means to maximize uh, your learning and why it's important that you, your founders, believes in that same, and I think the whole team needs to believe in the same, same goal and same motivation is uh, that it means that you go always to the things that are hardest uh, to achieve. It means that and, and always your motivation is, is to work with the best globally. Uh, and it means that you go to the customers that are uh, the hardest and the biggest globally. And we failed miserably with most of our customers at early days. Uh, but those customers teach us and now we're able to win almost all the customers in our vertical globally and all our competitors because those customers teach us a lot. But if our motivation internally would have been something else, uh, we were beaten up really, really badly uh, still a year and a half ago by almost all the customers. So uh, if the motivation would have been something else and not everyone being aligned, they would have quit or they would have told that we should go to, to the easy Finnish uh, customers that we can win easily and fast, but we can learn no, no nothing. But we went with, with like straight away with the largest online advertisers globally. Uh, so that's that's one very important thing, but that also goes goes to, to everything else. The investors you work with, the team members that you want to hire, uh, everything else. You need to go always and do the, do the selection that helps you to learn learn the fastest. So uh, I want to ask you, uh, as you say, like you don't have, um, you know, like coding skills. So in your first two startup, uh, you just have, a, you just had a, like a, an idea. How did you convince investors to invest so you can hire the team to build the product? Even though I know that it was a wrong, you know, like uh, strategy. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, we never got the investment at the first startup, but all the other three founders were coders. But what, what, what happened that they were also focusing not to coding, uh, but, but building the slide where and the strategy. Uh, so that was the problem. But, but this is, is, it kind of brings me to the, maybe the other very important topic when, when you think about getting started with your startup, that how you build the team and <clears throat> also what should be, what you should be doing uh, as, as a founder. So first of all, no one should start a company alone. That's, that's an important thing. And then you should absolutely work on your, your strengths. So I believe that every software company should have in the core founding team, the three critical uh, elements of, of any successful startup. Uh, 
again, I'm, I'm talking about SaaS startup, and the three essential elements that you need to have is, is product development, uh, it's sales and marketing, and it's, it's uh, hiring. So any successful startup needs to excel on those three things, and practically not, nothing else. Uh, and uh, I think all the, all the successful startups should have that culture uh, in their founding team. So software development and very fast prototyping of the software uh, should be in the founding team. So Tuomo is a full stack designer coder, so he built it actually the first version of the working version of the software single-handedly. And uh, I, I want to believe that I have pretty good capability of learning, hiring, and, and also marketing and sales. So we kind of covered all those three essential elements. If you lack one of those elements, especially at early days, the software development, the feedback loop from, from customer and markets is not fast enough to, to get the software iterated the stage that it actually serves the, the, the market and solves a critical problem from, from the customers. And if you can't hire, then when you, when you get customers to, to use your software, you're screwed because you, you won't have capability of scaling your product development and so forth. So those are, those are very, very important things to, in order to, to get started and to get from, from the po zero to the 0 0.1. And then when you think about the idea that what you want to do, uh, what kind of startup you want to build and in which market you want to be, I think the most important thing is, is uh, your ambition and your founding team, the competitive advantage that, that you have as a founding team. So the easiest way, which, which there is probably kind of two different thought leaders, Paul Graham, who is founder of Y Combinator, the most successful venture accelerator globally, and he believes really much solving your own problems. And then there is Steve Blank, the father of customer development and, and lean startup, who believes on the customer development process. And I'm a big, bigger believer of, of Steve Blank because I do SaaS software and Dropbox, Airbnb, for example, are, are kind of bigger believers of Paul Graham's uh, thinking. And they're also for Y Combinator. Uh, so maybe if you build con consumer facing software, it's easier to get started from your own problems that you have and you see on the markets. So I'll, I'll be talking about the, the other part uh, on an ideation phase, the Steve Blank's customer development process. But first of all, you should be thinking of what is your competitive advantage and what's your ambition? Because it will be so tough and so extremely hard uh, and so much banging your head against the wall that if you are not truly motivated about what you do, you will quit before you succeed. And normally people are motivated about the things that they really want to learn and where they can excel. So an understanding your strengths and weaknesses is really, really important. And then compensating your weaknesses with, with the other founders. So if you're two similar kind of girls or guys that think similarly and have a similar education, your chances of succeeding is really small. But if you're a very different skill set, coding and selling or recruiting and coding or whatever, uh, your chances of su succeeding is much, much higher. But then if you do something that you don't believe in, if you don't truly believe in, in the market, in the problem that you're solving, and if, if the money is the motivation, then it most likely will not succeed. And uh, I'll, I'll, yes, please ask the question. I'll finish the thought yeah, afterwards. Yeah, no, but I, I can tell story how we got started with, 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 with Smartly, Smartly IO, and it was really much kind of Steve Blank, Blank's uh, uh, co consumer, customer development process. So we were doing the LTV, predict, lifetime value predictions for mobile gaming companies, and we were discussing all of that. We were not able to find the product market fit. We start, tried a lot of different angles, and we were not able to find it with, with, with Metrify. But what we saw from the customers is that uh, all their advertising budgets very rapidly shifted to Facebook, actually. Uh, and instead of using our LTV predictions to optimize their mobile marketing from different channels, all of a sudden they were struggling 
with, with getting their ads placed to Facebook. And we realized that, oh my God, that there is actually second revolution of online marketing happening. Uh, so Google started the first 10 years ago, and then Facebook started the revolution of native advertising and mobile advertising roughly three years ago. And the change was so, and roughly after they did an IPO and realized that we actually need to make money for the investors as well. So, but the change was so rapid that our competitors were vanished from the markets. They couldn't keep their software up to date. And Facebook also chose the strategy to scale their revenue with partners like us and not alone. So they, they kind of, the timing was perfect, but the customers and customer needs showed us uh, the, the, the niche on the market. And then we started with those same customers that we were actually working at with Metrify, we started to, to build the prototypes of the product and asking their biggest problems uh, and, and got pretty fast product market fit uh, with, with, yes. Perhaps continuing your topic, when you found uh, smartly, why didn't you continue with Metrify with the same team or what was sort of the background for that? Yeah. So we had so big arguments at uh, Met Metrify between uh, me and Tuo and Osma and Nico, who are probably the most intelligent people I know. And I respect them a lot and we've discussed this and we're good friends nowadays and they're doing a great job in their own startups. But at that time, we, for half a year, we could not sit in the same room for more than five minutes without starting to scream to each other. And we couldn't just take any decisions. But, but the situation was that uh, we, we were, we've not been able to pay ourselves for, for a year. We ran out of money, we, were, we failed launching our product, we failed launch, uh, getting funding and everything else. So that was really a tough situation. But we couldn't agree on, uh, on the focus that we want to take. So then me and Tuomo, we decided to leave Metrify for them and we, we started a new company. It was just much easier than, than and, and we would never have succeeded together with and the reason why we started to argue was that, that the motivation to build the company was a bit different, but even bigger difference was the way how we believed uh, building a company. We, build, we believed in rapid prototyping and customer development, and they believed really much in a consulting and uh, being consultants for a year and getting uh, ideas and then start to slowly productize those ideas and automate those processes that uh, we do in the consulting. And there is nothing wrong with that approach. It can be really good, but we just fundamentally believed in two different ways of building company and we couldn't uh, match those beliefs. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to continue on that actually. Uh, in Smarty, at what point did you uh, hire your first and second employee? What was the point? You Way too late. Like? Way too late. So that's something if, if I think that we, so as I said, we, we learned a lot of things at, at Metrify, what we did wrong. We've done thousand things wrong at Smartly as well, but not the same things. And besides doing thousand things wrong, we've been able to grow extremely fast and it's impossible to build a perfect startup. It's just, it, it just won't happen. Uh, but one thing is actually, that I would change is that hiring developers much earlier. So my co-founder Tuomo is, likes to work alone. He's been always working alone uh, on the projects and he wants, he's, he's the fastest and the brilliant, most brilliant guy uh, building, I mean, understanding customer needs and building very, very fast hacking together a working product uh, alone that customers just says, wow, we didn't even realize that this was what we wanted. And uh, <coughs> two and a half years ago, when we saw the need for the, for the uh, and we had the rapid prototyping process kind of gone and we had the wireframes uh, very, very well uh, defined uh, for the cost customers. So, and, and for us, the metric was that eight out of 10 customers say that we want, we want this now and we want to pay for it. That when can we start to use the product? At that time, 
I would uh, hire at least two more engineers to work with, with, with Duomo. Uh, and there, that was not the fastest way. I believe that the fastest way was to get the product out was that Duomo built it alone and it took two months roughly to get the first version out. So, uh, and the things that kind of we learned and our ru good rule of thumbs that coders always underestimate the amount of work uh, and it at least three times bigger than they, they, they tell you. That's kind of the first thing. It's so hard and especially with Facebook advertising, you can't kind of your minimal viable product is a very large set of features that you get all the ad formats and all the targetings and everything in place. And you work on top of Facebook uh, ads API, so you need to actually cover all the use cases in order to make, make the product work. Uh, and what, why, why hiring much earlier? So it actually took three months and the same day that we launched the product live, Tuomo was burned out and we hired our first engineer, Lauri, Lauri Oikare. And then I needed to kick Tuomo. After one week, he handed over the whole product to Lauri and we kicked Tuomo for forced uh, one 10 days vacation in Croatia because otherwise he would just be burned out. Uh, and then Lauri was, oh my God, this software that I've seen, this code base that this software that I've seen for, for, for one week is now on my hands and there is actually customers using it on a daily basis. And why earlier is because of the, the culture. Uh, so Tuomo coded the whole software in his own way, using his own, uh, and no documentation, no communication, no, no one else helping to think how to solve the problems and how to make actually the code understandable for anyone else. So that's been actually slowing down our product development still till today that it was done by one person. And then Tuomo was almost, almost like I would believe that if, if we would have hired uh, Lauri two weeks later, Tuomo would be burned out. So uh, that's also an honor that it's, it's too much. So building those good processes, good PR processes, good documentation, good, good best practices using frameworks and, and the, 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 the whole kind of uh, syntaxes that everyone else understands is, is very important because when you get the product market fit, your biggest problem is to get coders recruited fast enough, but also get them productive fast enough and more simple, more understandable your code base is, the faster it is. Then on the other hand, I've never heard a software company that got a product market fit with per perfect engineering that all the fastest growing companies that you see there, it's piece of hack and one monolite with, with amazing amount of dependencies in the, in, in the code base. And then at some point you refactor. We are doing the great refactoring at the moment, building, building the software in the states that there is no dependencies and it's, it's microservices and you can change something here and it won't get, you won't get bugs here practically. We want very, very more if you don't understand anything about coding. What? We won't believe anymore if you don't understand anything about coding. I, I just can talk about coding. I can't code. Yeah. Okay. No, you, you need to, I think the important thing is that I, I'm not a coder. I, I maybe push live like two lines of code to our product just to impress our customers. And I've never, I, I won't become a coder because that's absolutely not my strength. But extremely important is that you respect and you, your willingness to understand the coders. And I've been working so long with the coders that I actually can give them advice. I can give them best practices how to do things because I just see so many things that have gone wrong. And, uh, but still I would not have any capability of, of, of giving them any advice how to technically solve something, but how to communicate how our software needs to be able to transform and how it needs to look like in, in, in two, three years. And, and we actually hired, and, and also in order to be able to hire those, those people. So we hired an excellent VP of engineering, Otto, just in the summer. Otto is the founder and CEO of Flowdoc and Flowdoc, uh, is kind of a Slack, but better product, a better engineering. And Slack is actually outsourced a lot of their uh, engineering, but they were just a bit too early compared to Slack. So Slack is a billion dollar company. Otto did a really nice exit to rally with Flowdoc. And he, he started leading our engineering uh, in the summer. And now he's been hiring huge amount of 
amazing engineers and, and kind of no one at the team had any close, any architectural or coding capabilities. So Otto, Otto was really important higher in the, but just in the summer, so a year and a half and cash flow positive fast growth with very crappy product. <coughs> Let's start from there and then go here. Yes. Can you hear? Um, so you said that in your earlier startups you failed um, in trying to get funding too early. So when do you think is the right time to get investors on board? So <laughs> never. Uh, no. Sometimes yes. Uh, so I think that. When you build a startup, if, if, you focus, if you focus on adding value and solving big problems for the customers and having the, the product there, meaning that you focus on getting a product market fit, the investors will come. We have at the moment weekly several high-level VCs trying to, to reach out and trying to get, I mean, trying to invest. And I have a copy-pasted email. Thank you for your interest. I appreciate a lot. We're growing fast. We are cash flow positive, and we are not looking funding at the moment. And they reply that 15-minute call, and then I reply politely that if I would use 15 minutes of my time uh, to you guys, we would never become successful startup. So that's what I believe. Still, uh, we were we were, but, but, but there is times when you should raise funding. Uh, we, we've raised funding and our investors are, are brilliant. And we raised funding for, for two, two reasons, uh, from Petteri from Lifeline Ventures and Moafak, who is a private angel. And they've been my mentors. They actually, we met Moafak when, Moafak was my mentor from early uh, Alto Yes days. And I actually went to Eetu and Jussi to tell that there is this Moafak guy I met just today that who wants to have a room here and then then Eetu and Jussi said that, of course, that they can move in Monday. And that's how I got to know Moafak five years ago. But that's just a funny story. Uh, but there is a few things. So first of all, me and Tuomo, we were still really, really inexperienced. And we wanted to second opinion from the people that we trust. Petteri at that time had seen being the chairman of the board at Supercell for, for uh, two years. And obviously, we believe that he's learned probably something because it was the fastest growing startup ever in the history of the world and so forth. And Moafak was just build SaaS software and, and scale globally a company before a Trema. But we wanted to have that advice and second opinion. And also we were bankrupt, so we couldn't work. We were working on a consulting gigs both uh, because we, don't, we didn't have money to pay the rent. So we needed to start to pay 3,000 euros for each of us that we can fully focus on, on, on smartly. So that's why we needed a funding. Uh, otherwise, we would have, and, and as we did with Metrify, we, we went with savings uh, that we had. But the most important thing is when you raise funding, and you obviously many times you need funding, uh, the most important thing is that don't waste your time raising funding. So with Petter and Moafak, what we did, that we had our monthly lunches throughout Metrify as well, just to think that what we should do, how is the market looking like and so forth. So we were getting, we were learning at every time. Uh, and then at some point they just told that, hey, that, have you been thinking that we really, they, they told that we don't really don't like Metrify, that we won't invest ever. And then at some point they told that, hey, this, starts to make sense now that have you been thinking about the small investment and we saw that say that actually yes that in order to fo fully focus on this project we actually need a uh, few hundred k and then we never showed a slide deck we never we we took more of to one customer meeting with us in in Helsinki and then he said that of course I invest and that was like it literally took no time for us and also then when you're scaling your company like create, there is very few investors, or actually probably two of them in, in Helsinki that I would uh, take as an investors to my company. It's even harder 
to get rid of investors than, than from your co-founders. So practically you're married and you can't divorce. So you, you'll, and they are, if, if you, and I see that way too often, that they have an information advantage in the negotiations. So they have all kind of veto rights and all kind of other things that they make sure and they can trick you really easily, make sure that they can do all the decisions. And if you do a successful exit, you will have nothing in your hand, but they have the liquidation preferences and so forth. So they can, they can easily ruin the whole, whole company. And I, I would not take anyone else from Helsinki, from Finland, as an investor, but these two, two guys. There might be other good ones, I just don't know them yet. Uh, so be very careful. And then the other stage is when you're scaling company. For example, now we are probably at some point willing to have Anders and Horowitz, which is the top tier VC globally, founder, investor at Google, Facebook, and every other successful startup. Uh, Globally, we probably want to have them as an investor for several reasons. They can help us hiring. They can give us a perspective to the markets that we would never ever get to from anyone else. And also when we want to take this company public in US, they can help us hugely understanding what needs to be, what steps needs to be taken beforehand and so forth. So when you really need help and you can't get that uh, from anywhere else, then talk to investors. And also, if you need, if, if you see that your machine is working, so meaning that the machine works that when you put one euro in, there is two euros coming out, then it makes sense to put 100 million euros in and get 200 million euros out, but only then. And at that point, the investor will reach out to you, most likely, not, not you needing to reach out to investors. Very good question. Yes, here was why, I guess. Yeah, you. Hey, uh, nowadays, uh, how are you taking care of yourself and your employees? Because yeah. uh, when are you taking care of yourself, you can make your vision come true. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very important questions. And I, I burned out myself at least twice, like literally that it took three months to require. require and uh, I don't want it ever to happen to me or any of my team members. So, and uh, we are all really excited all our 65 people are really excited what we do at work the problem is not to motivate people the problem is to get them out from the office at six six and say that you, you do something else do sports and also make sure that they won't work on the weekend so we have pre actually pretty strict rules uh, so we recommend you to, to to work eight hours max eight hours a day we enforce you not to work on the weekends and we 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 force you to to and no one is actually working on a weekend and it means it's it's much of our founders and leadership teams example as well so we're never shooting emails of low doc pings or anything else on the weekends and we're not expecting that anyone reads those emails on the weekends uh, and also we force people to take vacation once a quarter one week off uh meaning that you're not reading your email and not reading your flow doc or anything else. And I actually believe that it, it, it's a marathon we are running, not the sprint. So we need to be enjoying our lives now and seven years after and hopefully even, even longer. Uh, and uh, to be creative, as we all need to be very creative, very creative problem sol solvers, you need to, you need to go away from your routines. You need to take off time off to, to, to think. And it's very hard in a fast growing startup if you, if you don't go away for vacation or anywhere else. So I think that's important to force. force. It doesn't work that you have freedom to take holidays whenever you want because no one is taking holidays at that time. So, and then we, we, we have a lot of, we, we have a lot of one-to-one -one walks. Now we have one-to-one -one runs and we, uh, we go to have our one-to-ones in, uh, in running. We, we have a soccer team, we have a bicycling club. We, we kind of try to, to help people to get their practice. I, I bike, so I have no time to do sports otherwise, but I bike. So I biked from work here and I will bike home and I bike back from Munkinem to, to, to work every day back and forth. And that helps me to keep in shape. So it's just building those things into the routines that you have and making them like that no one is questioning those things. 
Uh, I would like to ask a question as well. Uh, I would like to continue about culture and ask about the moment when you realized that you need a kind of real office to work. And uh, how did you manage these pro working processes and communications before this moment when you have office? Yeah, that's a very <laughs> funny question. We, we still tr struggle. So we, we are two years old. We have six offices. Uh, so we've always outgrown almost before we have the office we've outgrown because it takes the, all, all the all the real things the physical things takes time all the virtual things goes fast but but so first of all with Metrify we, we were at startup sauna and we, we were working from there and that was a great in the ideation phase it was a really good place then we went to a co-working space with with Metrify and we continued with smartly to tribe studio so tribe 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 Combinator, I don't know, and Freda, but they were also fellow startup from from startup sauna, and they had a, this co-working space at Freda. We had one room there, and we actually spent a lot of time. So whole Metrify time after the start we spent there, and also the early days at Smartly. Uh, I think it's really important to have an office space because if you work from home or from cafes, it's it's at least for me, I can't work from home because I, then I think about work all the time. So I need to have two separate places. Then we moved, moved to gray area, the shared office space with gray area in Kaisaniemi. Then we had the first office space just a year and a half ago, the first office space. We were already 13, 15 people. And then we moved again uh, to Ruoholahti early this year so now that was like the real first place it was a huge place like 800 square meters and we thought that this will be enough for at least two years and six months and it was packed and now we expanded and uh, now we have 1200 square meters uh, and uh, just our VP engineering told today that it's it's opening on Friday and he told that it's actually will be packed before January uh, the office. So now we're trying to get Accenture away and expand our office to the next direction. So it's it's struggle, and we do really badly with 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 that because you need to have a buffer of six months to to actually get the office space expanded. And then we have one office in San Francisco, one in Berlin, which we just opened the Berlin office, and we will be opening one in Singapore, probably one in Sao Paulo in Q, Q1 as well. So then then it's a totally different challenge that we have five or six different office spaces globally uh, and trying to, to manage the communication and everything else is it's just now we have a house in San Francisco where peop, the, the guys work and live in the same same place so and we are trying to look for office space but it's way too expensive to get anything uh, they, yeah, please go. Okay, so in the beginning you told us that uh, you started this uh, also in the yeah. entrepreneurship society yeah. and then it expanded to whole village. So if you would briefly tell a little bit like what challenges did you face and if someone else is trying to do the same in Europe or in some other Russia or some yeah. other countries, what mistakes we should avoid? That's a, that's a very good question and it also ties into to the topic that I promised to, to tell and now it's really good that what what I've learned and how I, I believe that actually building Alto E a startup sauna uh, Alto Ventures program and the Stanford collaboration have been have teach me actually almost as much as the startups uh, Metrify for example and also it's been benefiting us a lot uh, so there is few things that we did uh, very very well and it's, it's very similar in, in many cases what we do do now so first of all we, we, we needed to hire brilliant people brilliant people that other people wants to follow and wants to, 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 to believe and wants to, to, to listen that's still what we do in a different context but that we did really well at Alto ES and we, we hired people kind of the presidents of the guilds mostly they were the most entrepreneurial people we found. We hired them as a volunteers to, to work with us. And that's how the, the word spread out. And they were the leaders in their own communities. 
that, that helps hugely. Most of them, by the way, works at the moment at Smartly. So we've hired huge amount of people we will be working with uh, at Alto ESS Startup Sauna previously. So that's kind of been our biggest lead flow, deal flow for, for, for team members. Uh, also, the other thing that I learned, and I think everyone else at Alto has learned, that we need to make people to believe in our vision. We need to have a strong vision, and then we need to make people to believe in it. We made Eto to believe in it, and we made Steve Blank or Tina Selig from Stanford or anyone else to believe in that vision, or Morten Mikko, Sami Inkinen, whoever, that were coaches, speakers, sponsors, or otherwise helping offering the space and so forth. So we, we needed to sell that vision all. But, uh, what did you do to make them believe because then you were starting from the very early point yeah. and you don't have any sort of right. thing in your head. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> have, have you read a book called uh, Dale Carnegie's book, How to Influence People and, and Win Friends? So I think that describes really well what you need to do in order to to make people willing to, to help you and your vision. The other thing is that you need to have a strong vision. So Nokia was falling down. Everyone was talking the Finnish economy <laughs> sucks already at that time. Not much has happened and now it sucks much more. But it's a still relevant problem that was appealing. And we, we, talk, we, we, we told to people that, hey, that there is actually what we've seen in US and MIT and Stanford that most new jobs and the GDP, big part of the GDP growth is generated actually by these young companies that grows like Google and Facebook. And why there is none of this in Finland? No, well, the reason was the culture. And then we kind of have a very appealing vision that we were able to, to communicate really well. And then we actually took action, uh, organized events, organized mentoring programs and so forth that started to gather a lot of people and everyone got excited. And then it's a lot of the, the, the charisma of people uh, being able to, to self-believe in the vision, but then communicating to other people that they start to believe in the vision. And then when you get the critical mass, then everyone just wants to get involved and then it's easy. But, but the, 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 the start is, 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 is hard and it's, I think it's every founder's and CEO's job to get people to believe in your, first of all, have the vision and then get people to believe in your, your vision. And if you're not able to do that, it's, it's really, really hard. And it doesn't mean that you need to be a good speaker or good, good, good talker. You can do it via internet, you can do it in a small groups or whatever, but, but you need to make, by some means, you need to make the people to believe in your, your vision. Time is running, so we have time for the last I just thought that it was really good last question, but well, we can have one more. Yes, All right. absolutely. Uh, so, uh, as I remember, you uh, you told me something like, uh, you know, like uh, in the last meeting that uh, we always burned. We should not burn our money, but we should burn investors' money. Right? That means that we have to get investors involved in yeah. the beginning. During yeah. the building the prototype. Yeah. So how, how, how do you convince them? Say yeah. you don't have uh, like personal yeah. connection, like in your case. Yeah. So I think that's that's a very good point, and I think it was probably wrongly understood. So good feedback for me. Uh, so there is two different things. You should not burn as as a company. You should not burn anyone's money. You should be making money for yourself and for for your investors. Absolutely. Uh, but then, in the other other hand side, if you think as an as an early entrepreneur and uh, kind of thinking that, that what is your chances to succeed with, with your startup that you're starting now. They are very, very small. They are one out of hundred. And if you do a personal bankruptcy with your first idea, you will never become successful. So doing, a, doing kind of building a fast growing startup by not making a personal bankruptcy is the only way to become successful. You, you probably need to do three or eight or ten uh, startups before you, you get successful. So that means few things. You should A, not be burning money at all before you know what you do and before you have a product market fit. So you bootstrap as long as you can. And starting a company nowadays doesn't take any money. You don't need an office. Uh, at the early days, you need, you, you can, with, with 10, probably free, use all the software that, that you need 
to, to build the first prototypes and get the first paying customers as well or the users. So, so you should not be uh, burning anyone's money before you know that this will be, be something. And then when you know that it will be something, still the risk is really, really high. So if you then take, uh, take your, what is Pantata, your house, and, and if you fail, you lose your house and your family, then you'll be screwed up probably like totally. And uh, it means that you'll never get a second chance to try out. So at that time, that's why VCs exist, that they can leverage the risk uh, and you can scale your company uh, with not taking your own loan, but with investor's money. So that's probably kind of the, what I tried to say last time. Uh, and and if, you, if you do a bankruptcy yourself, it, it just, you just, it's very unlikely that you will succeed because it's so hard to get startups off the ground. All right, very good advice. And still you should start your startups and follow your dreams. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's, that was some even better advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Krista. Um, thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, you for sharing all your experience. Um, we have so much to learn from you. And thank you, you all, for coming here. Thank you. Thanks to Design Factory for this fabulous space. Uh, let's give a big hand once again to Krista.